Happy, Happy National, National Herpes, Herpes Awareness Day. Day! We're so proud to introduce to you episode two of the podcast, which is called Did You Hear That She Has Herpes? Where a friend of mine comes out publicly for the first time about a herpes diagnosis, and then another friend of mine who's an expert on herpes sheds light in a way that I needed. This episode was really um, impactful for me to, to produce because a few years back, somebody who was close to me came out and told me about their herpes diagnosis. And I wish with all my wishes that I could have been able to send them this episode. That to be said, I highly encourage you to not only listen to this for yourself, but be very mindful of who else could hear this message. It's one of my favorite episodes actually. Let's talk about herpes, baby. Yes, Let's talk about we're you going there. Let's talk. I didn't know how else to start this. Thanks. <laughs> because I know that this is nerve wracking for is. you. So it I is. It is. We would burst into song. Ah, oh, no, I appreciate that. And you make it much less nerve wracking because you you're so calm about it. <laughs> you're like, you got this. But it is because this is not something that people talk about, right? And it's why this had it was something that I had so much shame around and was a deep, dark secret for so long for me because it felt like no one else had it, <laughs> even yep. though we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. So at the time, it was a very lonely experience. I didn't tell my, you know, my mom even, girlfriends, like I did not tell anyone and I kept that to myself. And you could see how that's a heavy burden to carry mm -hmm. of something that you feel is wrong, that is not, not gonna go away even though it is manageable and it does go away, you don't live with outbreaks. It's just like anything. Yes. Uh, but it was so uncomfortable the first time it happened. And I remember going to bath afterwards, they tell you to put Epsom salt and all that. And I just remember just crying to myself, just crying, why me? You know, <laughs> getting into that mode. And then it went away. And then it was almost like, oh, okay. I went into a bit of a denial and I almost thought I had cured myself. I did all these things like, I don't have it, like affirmations, it's not there. And because it, never, it didn't really come back again, in my mind, I thought, okay, I'm not someone with herpes anymore. Mm -hmm. And that continued for a long time. And I am not proud of that. And I think finally it came to a point where I had to take a deep look at myself and my relationships. Did you have another outbreak since? I had a hit here and there. And I it and even while I'd been in monogamous relationships, I I would hide it. Not proud of that. Mm. Like, and it was crazy as in some of those relationships, I would say, Well, they're not showing up for me. They're not fully, you know, there. Yeah. And yet I started asking myself, Well, am I fully there? Am I fully showing up the way I want to be? Like, look, everything's a mirror for what you're putting out there. That's such a great point. Yes. Right. And so it was easier kind of as I was younger and going through that. But as I got older and it became clear, OK, I want to find that person I want to start a family with, get married to a partner yes. for life. I finally confronted the fact that I needed to deal with this and, and really understand the trauma because it is a trauma a physical mental and emotional trauma and i never dealt with it not once in therapy had i brought it up you and didn't even tell your therapist i didn't even tell my therapist <laughs> that's how much uh, in denial i was and that, like and that's how much I, shame is around this it was my deep dark secret i said i was taking it to the grave like i was like but then it became obvi more obvious as I was learning about these spaces and working on myself, my personal growth, really taking accountability for my life. I realized this is the w a major thing that I had not processed properly or confronted properly. And I had to understand why. Mm -hmm. What did this diagnosis really mean to me as a person, because as a diagnosis, once again, which is what the surprising thing, it's not a big deal. Yes. It's manageable. Mm -hmm. There's preventatives. There's like, yeah, when you get an outbreak, you take a pill, it goes away in five days. It's like anything. It's not ideal, but it's not gonna kill you. But you know what will kill you is your mentality around it, mm -hmm. your emotional health around it. And when I finally 
reconciled that of what I was feeding myself, the the hurt and pain I was keeping inside of me. Of, Did you think about it every day? A lot of times when it was, it was amazing. And sometimes I didn't think about it and it was just like, oh, I haven't thought about it in a while. That's the thing I have. Okay. And then what I, what I noticed is every time I would think about it or get anxious or stressful, just like a canker p- pops up or you get pimples, it would pop up. And so for me, a big part of coming to peace with, with it was also really being able to understand myself and my nervous system and like what actually brings me peace. Mm-hmm. So you could see how that's a, a huge, beautiful evolution. So there's a lot of beauty in this when I was ready to confront it. And my hope is it doesn't take people as long as it took me, but everyone has their own journeys. But in more people speaking out, they could realize, okay, I got this. And yes, I get to talk about it and feel it. It's not about keeping those feelings inside and process what this means to me. Because it could mean different things to different people depending on your socioeconomic backgrounds, your race, your gender, privilege, access to healthcare. I mean, it can mean so many different things to so many different people. And so my hope is that the other side of this and and this experience for me has really forced me to look at myself and to understand my needs, understand what intimacy really means to me, mm-hmm. consent, and also understand that it's okay to be rejected. Wow. I think that that is such a powerful sentiment that is unique and a fresh take. I want you to unpack that more. What does that mean? Okay to be rejected? Yeah. A big fear or in approaching this and sharing with people, specifically because I'm I'm a cis hetero woman, men, my relationship with men was I won't be accepted and they're not going to want to be with me. Mm-hmm. Let's Let's step back. Betrayal in this case that happens when you don't disclose or you're not having these more intimate conversations. It's not just a betrayal to the person you're with. It's a betrayal to yourself Mm -hmm. because you are also assuming that someone's not going to love you for all of you. You're rejecting yourself. Yeah. You're basically, so then yeah, let's get to the next layer of that. How much is it someone else's rejection versus what you've already done to yourself? That's, that's heavy to carry that. And also to acknowledge that that you've basically also been punishing yourself in the process. And I was doing that for years. And while I appear confident and like, I love myself, I preach self-love. I don't know, like that it does not feel like self-love. Chapter one of your book, let me hold it up because you know I'm obsessed, uh, Strange <laughs> Bedfellows. It's a book that I just literally reference all the time. Um, chapter one actually is about herpes. Is that on purpose? It's called Killing the Scarlet H. It is completely on purpose. It was totally intentional because that is the STI for which I get the most questions, for which my patients are most concerned. When they get the diagnosis, they you know, feel devastated. And I just think like, let's put that in perspective. I mean, I completely understand that people, when they come out with an STI diagnosis, they get slut shamed. Like they're out there trying to be sex positive, trying to advocate, trying to normalize STIs. And they get slut shamed by people saying, you know, I've even had folks who are out on social media having people say like, you deserve to die. You know, you don't deserve to, you know, have a sex life because now you're unclean, whatever, infected, contaminated. And so, yes, people are hesitant. The more people we have like Shira, the more people we have out there who are saying, yes, I had an STI and I'm fine. You know what I mean? I'm living with it or I cured it and I'm fine. The more people we have like that, the better we're going to, you know, get in terms of cracking the nut around stigma. And, you know, so I tell people all the time, like I've had at least one STI that I know of. I had HPV for a couple of years and and that's a, a super common STI that everybody gets. And herpes is right up there in terms of how many people have it. And, you know, in fact, as you know, Shan, more than half of us in this country have at least one type of herpes. So why are we going to go around slut shaming people for something that most of us have? It doesn't make any sense. The first couple of years that somebody gets a herpes, after someone gets a herpes diagnosis, they are more likely to be shedding, more likely to have outbreaks. So those are the years where transmission risk is the strongest. And so taking suppression every day during those years can actually, you know, greatly reduce, like it can reduce by 50% or more the risk of transmitting to another partner. 
after that time period, if you're not having any outbreaks, then the choice to go on suppression is kind of like an optional thing. So if you do want to prevent transmission to partners, we do know that you will be shedding, even though you have no outbreaks, you'll probably be shedding, you know, for about three days a month for the rest of your life. And so you can take, you know, antivirals to just reduce that risk even a little bit more of transmission, but it's not something you have to do. With HIV prep, as you mentioned, which is kind of like a birth control pill for HIV, once you stop taking it, that's it. You're, you know, just as vulnerable as you were prior. It's not like when you're actually living with herpes or HSV where it starts, you know, it's really kind of... um prolific in the beginning, and then it starts to burn out, you know, over time. But again, someone who's living with HSV is going to be shedding a little bit for the rest of their lives, and they should expect that. I had no idea that there was actually down to the number of days. So do you know for the first two years, what percentage of the time somebody might be shedding? Lovers and friends, lovers and friends. I'm going to take you on a trip, baby, I don't pretend. I said, lovers and friends, uh, I'm going to hold you down, down to the end. I said, 